good course today. This course is talking about um, truth and deliverance through the Word of God or deliverance through the aspect of truth. I know, and we've already taught and we've already offered you courses, <clears throat> uh, if you happen to have been in that class, where we talked about deliverance um, just from the perspective of the deliverance ministry, casting out demons, this type of thing, spiritual warfare. I want to talk to you about spiritual warfare in the sense of <coughs> the authority, the veracity, and the integrity of the Word of God. How many of you know Scripture says that the Word will not return void? The Bible is implying to us that when God's word is put to voice, that it goes out. And as it goes out, heavenly host, the Holy Spirit are there to back up that powerful, uh, life-giving, delivering word of God. And I firmly believe that when a believer is anointed, when a believer is preaching and teaching the and I'm going to say it this way, undefiled word of God. Amen. Not man's philosophy, not opinions and psychology and all this stuff, but just preaching the word. I believe people are set free, free through the hearing of the word. I, I truly believe that. And I believe that, and I personally, I can say that this, this topic I'm teaching, I have been living and practicing for at least 20 years, if not longer, uh, when God introduced me to this concept. You know that I've traveled in over, well, it's approaching 40 nations and most of those multiple times. So I've encountered a lot of warfare, demonic activity, all kinds of things. And I have found and proven that for the majority of people, and let me say this, particularly Western people who tend to be more analytical, who tend to be more protective and closed in their personalities. You know, they're not as open and they're not as emotional that, you know, we Westerners want to make sure that, you know, everything's, you know, going to be right when it's over with. And no, you, you know how we are. But in actuality, I've found that this method of uh, preaching, teaching, and administering deliverance is powerful with Western people. Because the Word of God is sharp and quicker than a two-edged sword, amen. It has the ability, and I like to say it this way, like a sword to just split you down the middle, separate joints and marrow from soul and spirit, amen. And it goes right into a person, and it begins to cut loose and deliver and to heal and to restore, amen. So I believe in the integrity of the Word. Now, I believe in prayer. I believe in casting out devils, you know. But we're talking to you today about this aspect of powerful ministry. Uh, if you want to look at your table of context, uh, contents, I just want to just point out the different sections. And the reason I'm doing this um, today before we start is because I'm going to flow rather quickly through some sections. In other words, I will address uh, what I believe are some essentials that need to be pointed out. But you'll notice as you follow along your notes that in some sections, I won't spend a lot of time. I'll just hit some high points because here's the reason. I really want to spend the, the um, <clears throat> majority of our time on the section that deals with the seven steps or breaking free from enemy strongholds because I want to make this practical. I want you to be able to go out of here and know how to minister to people. Uh, and help them find freedom and deliverance through the Word of God. Amen. So just going through these quickly, the first section deals with who are you. You've been in integrity, all of you, I think, for uh, 12 months now, or I mean uh, 10 months now. You're right up to that point. You, you already have a relationship with God. You've already been students of the Word. Uh, I believe most of you are aware of who you are in Christ. Amen. We're going to Hit on a few high points in that and then move on. Section two deals with the mind. We have had some great courses over the past 10 months that deal with the mind. Uh, Dr. Lavenda Reckner taught on uh, some of these issues here and, uh, and, and, and uh, I, we've touched on some in some of the other courses. So, so we'll, we'll won't spend much time there. In section three, uh, most frequently targeted areas. I'm gonna, I'm gonna slow down a little bit in that one because I want to emphasize how people get caught and hung into areas of bondage, strongholds, and things of that nature. Uh, I want you to understand nobody 
comes out of the womb shouting and hollering, you know, wound my soul, you know, feel, influence me, you know, fill me with your evil power. Nobody does that. The devil has to find an opportunity, a door. He has to discover a way to take advantage of that infant or that young woman or that that uh, young man, in other words, or, or any of us at any point. And so we're going to talk about how the devil tricks and how he uh, manipulates to get a stronghold in people's lives. And in section four, talks about preparing to break free from enemy strongholds. We won't spend a lot of time on that one uh, other than to use it as a springboard to, to break us into section five, where we're going to talk about breaking free from enemy strongholds. And this one, we're going to do every little bit of it. Okay, because I want to spend the, the, uh, the, the better part of our time on this as if, and I want to do it as if I was leading someone in my office in a deliverance session using the Word of God, a truth encounter. Can you say truth encounter? Because that's really what this is all about today. And I'm assuming all of you being good students have already read the study guide. So um, you've got already got a working knowledge of what I'm talking about. So as we go through it today, maybe I can help you make it more practical. And then section six, maintaining your freedom. We're going to touch on a little bit of that. But I think by the time we finish with section five, we won't have much time left in the day to spend a lot of time in that. And fortunately, it's something that you can utilize and use as you read through it. So let's go ahead and get started. Just quickly take a we're going to take a quick look at introduction. Uh, in the introduction, we see that Pontius Pilate, and of course you've read this in the scripture, he asks the question, what is truth? And God answers this question, or Jesus actually in John 17, 17. Scripture says, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Amen. So what is truth? It's the word of God. Truth is truth. The Word of God. See, the only protection from deception is being rooted and grounded in the Word of God. And deception is the devil's number one tool or instrument that he has perfected and he is very skilled at, that he uses to entrap precious people. Amen. And yes, not only lost people, but even Christians can become deceived. The devil loves to deceive, amen. So a truth encounter with the Holy Spirit and God's word is a life-changing experience. John chapter 117 uh, says, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. I want you to have an encounter with grace and truth in this lesson today. I want you to meet Jesus in a fresh and a new way. I know you already know him, but I want you to encounter him in a personal way today because I believe not only are we going to learn and be equipped in how to administer a truth deliverance, we're going to also experience new freedom in areas of our lives as we break the bread of life today. So the enemy of our soul has worked diligently to prevent God's people from experiencing the freedom Jesus Christ died to give us. He does this by attempting to build strongholds within our minds that have been established upon lies. An enemy stronghold in our minds could be described as a false perspective of reality. Could I ask you to say reality? If you will study the word reality, you will find that a key definition of reality is one word truth. Truth. Reality is truth. And listen to me. Truth is reality. I want you to understand the devil wants to give you a false sense of reality. One of his big techniques in administering his deception is to cause you to believe that you have a grasp of reality when in fact you don't. Let me say it this way. He wants you to believe you have a grasp of truth when in fact you don't. I want to say something about truth and reality. You don't have to defend it. 
if you're always defending what you believe and always defending your position on any issue or topic, particularly in the spirit realm, you need to re-examine your position because truth is reality. Reality can't be changed. It can be twisted, it can be lied about, it can be, uh, you know, uh, 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 manipulated in a way that just, it makes it deceived and it, it can appear to be a new truth or reality, but the real truth always stays the same and remains the same, amen? And remember, the word of God will not return void, amen? So truth will work in the midst of, <clears throat> of, of any situation, amen? Um, so God's perspective is the only true reality. This is why we have to encourage Christians today to read the Bible. We have, unfortunately, a generation that is biblically illiterate. Okay? They can't even tell you who Noah was, who Moses was. Many people today don't even know who Jesus Christ is. I know that seems to be hard to believe, but it is a fact today. And so we need to educate the population, especially the Christian church, in the Word of God. Believers need to read the Bible. Why? Because the Bible's reality. And the devil wants to twist the truth in their lives concerning their life, their situation, and their future. And he can do that if we don't know and recognize truth. So once the devil's lies are exposed by the truth and we, we renounce those lies, we can build godly strongholds based upon the solid foundation of the word of God. A lot of people today need to almost repent and start over in their walk with God. Because they are walking in a place of total confusion. They are walking in a place of deception. And they probably go to church regular. They probably pay tithes. They probably raise their hands and worship God. They're trying to serve God. But because they don't have a grasp on truth. Where do you find truth? The word of God. The Bible. Amen. So they're easily swayed and they're easily manipulated. Unfortunately, we have people's in, people in leadership roles that because they're doing their best to try to be good leaders, but they're failing because they don't know what truth is. Okay? Damaged emotions often cause people to develop poor judgment. Negative circumstances and trauma experienced in life can do serious harm to our minds. How many of you know people are just ravaged by the devil these days. The stress level today, the pressure that is on people, all the sin and all the rampant uh, <clears throat> crime and everything that's going on uh, is, just, is just tearing the mind and the heart out of people today. And because of all these wounds and these scars, people are open prey to the attack of the devil. Because if I'm not grounded in truth, then when something like that happens to me, I do not know how to respond to the circumstance. That's why one of the first responses that someone who's been violated, let's say they've been raped or molested uh, or incest has taken place. Did you know one of the first responses is that person feels like they did something to deserve it, something to bring it about. And the truth is, no. There is nothing you can do as a person that gives someone else the license to commit that kind of sin against you. But the devil, because immediately they are not undergirded by a strong foundation, the wounds become magnified and the pain is intensified because the devil says, aha, that's who you are. That happened to you because of who you are. And God says, oh, no, that's not who you are. The devil did that to you because he was attacking you, because he was victimizing you. How many of you hear what I'm saying today? People need to know the truth. Amen? Condemnation is wreaking havoc in people's hearts and lives because they don't know who they are. And the devil is such a liar. Amen? 
The devil tells people all the time, well, remember what you did. And in your heart, you know that you've repented and you know that God's forgiven you, but the devil says, how could a righteous God forgive you of such a terrible thing? And he wants to hold you back. So we've got to know who we are, amen. No one in their right mind would willingly agree with the devil, amen. Amen. But his influence in our thought lives is so subtle that if we are not intentionally guarding our minds, we may unintentionally agree with his suggestions. Doing so results in greater harm and increased negativity in our thoughts and lives. I want to tell you, because we're not going to spend a lot of time on the mind today, although there's a good section in here on it, the devil's playground, or I should say his battleground, is your mind and my mind. And we need to take it back, amen, because he's trespassing on territory that belongs to the Lord, amen. Amen, amen. Let me read scripture to you. Hebrews twelve fifteen says, Exercise foresight and be on the watch to look after one another, to see that no one falls back from and fails to secure God's grace, his unmerited favor and spiritual blessing, in order that no root of resentment, rancor, bitterness, or hatred shoots forth and causes trouble and bitter torment, and the many become contaminated and defiled by it. Amen. Um, I love this passage, no matter what translation you read it from. And someone may say, why don't you use different translation? I don't use different translations to try to uh, manipulate people or confuse people. The only reason that I would use different translations is to try to make a little more clarity in what's being said. Amen. So the principle applies to every area of our lives, our health, finances, relationships, ministry, and everything else. So you and I can look at any area in our life and say, how is this area when I filter it through the filter of truth? Are there some things in here that I've been tricked on, that I have had a spell cast on me? When you filter it through the filter of truth, and it looks like this, amen, and it doesn't always happen in just a moment. It takes time as you read the Word and as you pray over the Word and as you pray the Word. It takes time, but God will begin to reveal to you and help you. Amen. So the devil continually searches for a doorway into our thought lives so that he can trick us into agreeing with him. 1 Timothy 2, 3, and 4 says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved, and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God has never set in motion a will for any human being that ever included deception. God's desire is for you and I to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. Truth is a progressive thing. It unfolds as we walk in the word with God. Amen. I said truth is progressive. It unfolds as we walk in the word with God. It begins to take its effect and release its impact when you come in covenant with Christ. When you're born again, the Holy Spirit begins to illuminate. Have you ever witnessed to people or talked to people and they're, they're lost and they say, well, I've tried to read the Bible and it don't make sense to me. That person eventually gives their heart to Christ. Next time you see them, they go, man, the Bible is the most exciting book. I'm learning so much. Wow, it's so good. What happened? The light came on. When Jesus came into their spirit, their heart, all of a sudden they had divine illumination. They had an ability, a translator, an interpreter to breathe life into that powerful logos, amen, and it becomes rhema, glory to God. I'm telling you what, it's exciting. We need a new passion for the word of God. We need a new passion for the Bible. Amen? Amen. Uh, John 8, 36 says, So if the Son liberates you, makes you free men, then you are really unquestionably free. Can I ask you to do something for me? Stop questioning your freedom. Amen? Because the Son has set you free. Glory to God. Section one now, we're moving into our first section. It says, who are you? We're going to kind of breeze through this, but we are going to touch on some 
important area. So the focus of our course is aimed toward discovering those things which hold us in bondage to the enemy and hinder spiritual growth. We're going to discover that most of the things that hinder our lives have their roots within our own minds in the way we think. We have a friend who for 30 plus years we've known him. He has a huge ministry um, uh, and many churches... His church is not in just one place. It's in many different places. I mean, he has churches all over. Uh, and they watch him, you know, from the major church. But he has said for many years that we've got to deal with the stinking thinking. Amen. And I think you probably heard Joyce Meyer say that, too. I've heard her use that phrase. And the truth is, is that we have got to deal with it. Amen. Because it is destroying our lives and it's robbing us of the freedom and the liberty we have. If somebody were to ask you, who are you? What would be your response? Would you just give them your name? Uh, would you give them a little bit of information uh, about who you're in relationship with and what you do for a living? Or if, they were, if someone were to ask you, who are you? Uh, <clears throat> how would you respond? Would you respond by saying, well, this is me. Look at my face. Uh, or give your job title or your marital status. What would you say? These things, really, I want to say to you, don't define you. Amen. All they are is physical or natural, uh, what shall I call them, characteristics that make up who you appear to be in the natural, but in reality, who are you? Many appear to have it all together on the outside, but they've re erected a false front to disguise who they, how they feel about themselves on the inside and to cover up secrets. So what are we saying here already? What you already know. What you see is not what you get. <laughs> in this world, what you see is not what you get. <laughs> Hello? Amen. <laughs> I mean, and that's a fact. And we've all learned that. By the time I, we all get to the age we are, we've learned that, haven't we? Uh, <laughs> I tell, like to tell young people when they're looking for a spouse, what you see is not what you get. Hello? <laughs> so we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. I'm reading scripture here. How differently we know him now. That's 2 Corinthians 5.16. Um, and here's another a quote by Neil Anderson. He says, We mistakenly think that good appearance plus the admiration it brings equals a whole person. Or we feel that star performance plus accomplishments equals a whole person. Not so. These equations are no more correct than 2 plus 2 equals 6. Amen. We all can still remember enough from, from school that we know that ain't true, right? So King Solomon had power, position, wealth, possessions, and he had women. If meaningful life is the result of appearance, admiration, and performance, accomplishments, status, recognition, then he would have been the most together person that ever lived. Solomon's great wisdom led him to conclude that all his achievements were utterly meaningless. We want to take his advice, amen. Status and possession of material things do not provide personal wholeness. But how many people are killing themselves trying to make more money? Wearing themselves out emotionally trying to build more relationships. Make people like them. If you don't believe me, look at Facebook. Amen. <laughs> I mean, it's full of personal promotion. <coughs> Amen. So uh, we want to remember that we're a child of God. And if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord of life, the only thing that will bring personal wholeness is a relationship with him. Amen. With the Lord. Glory to God. Everybody wants to experience wholeness and a meaningful life. The good news is, is that everyone has the same opportunity to live life to its fullest because completeness and meaning in life are not the results of what we have or don't have or what we've done or what we haven't done. Man, we need to stop and think about that for a minute because there are a lot of people in the church who think they need to do certain things in order to be acceptable in order for God to love them or prove of them, in order to be worthy. And I want to tell you something, that all of your works and all of your preparation and all of your good 
doing needs to flow out of your understanding of his having done. You are who you are because of the work Christ has done on the cross. The scripture declares that you and I are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You get outside of Jesus, where's your righteousness? Amen. Stay in Jesus. It's a place of rest. Now, in your place of rest, you want to understand him to know him, to discover him more. So what happens? Then you start doing good works, not to gain your acceptance or salvation or your who you are. You do it as evidence of who you are because of your love for him and your desire. But don't let anybody tell you that you have to do certain things at certain times in a certain way in order to be a Christian or to be right with God. No, what you have to be to be right with God, is born again. You have to put faith in Christ and you have to give yourself in relationship and love to him. In other words, I'm not saying that you can just come up and get your fire insurance and then live like you want. That's not the point. If you're truly born again, you are transformed from the inside out and your life will make you become a follower of Christ. Amen. You will do the works of righteousness because you are who you are in him. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so I think these are things we want to consider. Let's talk about identity theft here for just a minute. Uh, why do so many Christians struggle with self-worth, sp uh, uh, spiritual growth, and maturity? And the reason is, is simple. It's because we've been deceived. Our identity in Christ has been distorted by the father of lies. Amen. An individual can believe that they're evil. How can a child of God, however, be evil? Think about this for a minute. They may have done things that are evil, but they are not evil. Laurie and I were talking about this yesterday. When we were raising our boys, uh, when one of our four boys would do something bad, I would say to the boy, the son, I would say, son, you're a good boy, but what you just did was bad. Hello. My boy's a good boy, but his deeds were bad. Son, we got to correct this behavior because this behavior doesn't line up with good boys. Hello. And this is the way God deals with us. God looks at us and he sees Christ. He sees the blood of the lamb over us. And he says, oh, my precious child, you're a good child. Oh, but what if I just sinned? He says, but what you just did wasn't nice. So you need to make it right. Well, Father, I don't know how to make it right. He says, you need to go back to the foot of the cross and you need to ask forgiveness and make the relationship right again. The relationship, relationships are twofold. They're, the relationship is with God through Christ and the relationship with, is with my brother or my sister if they were partakers in my offense. Are you with me? If I've hurt someone else or offended someone else, then I need to make the triangular relationship or the twofold relationship, if you want to say it from your perspective, right again. What do I do? I make it right with my brother and I make it right with my Lord. Amen. So the relationship is right. Amen. Praise God. So uh, Satan <clears throat> loves to throw accusations concerning the behavior, our behavior. And he likes to take those uh, missteps, those sins, those, those, those issues that we fail in, and he likes to attach them to our identity. He wants to say to us and deceive us to believing that now we are not just a Christian, but we are a addicted Christian. We are a adulterous Christian. Hello? He wants to attach your sin to who you are. But because of the cross and repentance, we need to understand that doesn't make that who you are. That makes that a sin that you repent of and you walk away from. Is everybody with me in this? This is real important because a lot of Christians get lost in this, uh, particularly those that have addictions, addictions to drugs, to alcohol, sex, addictions to whatever. They feel like God <coughs> and the devil beats them up. He says, you're not no Christian. Christians don't do that. <coughs> Christians don't do that. And so we go, well, you know, I keep stumbling. I keep falling back into the same thing. And the, really, the, the very 
The very essence of their problem, their addiction is, is that they're believing the lie of the devil instead of believing the truth of God. The truth of God is, is that you're not an addict. Hello? But as long as they believe the lie of the devil, they keep going back to drugs or alcohol. But once I start believing I'm a child of God, I begin to reject and despise that addiction. Amen? So it's all in believing in who we are. We have to be tricked by the devil into believing that what we do or what has been done to us makes us what we are. The deception sends many into a downward spiral of hopelessness and defeat. Failure doesn't define you, though. Your heavenly Father does. Failure is never final in God's house. Everybody fails, okay? Everybody fails. The Proverbs say, a wise man falls seven times, but he rises up again. The question is, not did you fall, but what did you do once you fail? Amen? Many Christians become stuck in a cycle of sin, confess, sin, confess, sin, confess, without ever experiencing the freedom that comes from receiving the forgiveness of God. Amen? Amen. I remember growing up uh, <clears throat> in a church to where uh, we had church obviously three times a week, but Sunday nights they called the evangelistic service. The deal was, though, there were never any lost people there. It's the same people that were there Sunday morning, but on Sunday night, everybody would get saved again. How crazy is that? But we were sort of taught, if we weren't directly taught, it was strongly implied that if you committed any sins that week, you lost your salvation. And you got to get right with God now. And so the altars would fill up every Sunday night. And I can remember Sunday night after Sunday night being in the altar. Oh, God, I'm so sorry, God. Oh, God. You know, and it's like, how ridiculous. Amen. We don't have to wait to Sunday night. And we sure don't have to get saved again. God didn't kick his children out of the house because they messed up. Amen. Now, obviously, the Lord chastens those whom he loves. The Lord will con bring conviction through the Holy Spirit. God will call us to account on our shortcomings, but he will quickly forgive us. Amen? Amen. If we believe this is the way we relate to God, then we're not placing faith in the work of Christ on the cross. 1 John 1.9 says... But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. Amen? Amen. If we're ignorant of Satan's deceptive practices, we may give him access to uh, our decision-making process. We have to always stay on guard and refuse to allow him to take advantage of us. 2 Corinthians 2.11 says, So that Satan will not outsmart us. For we are familiar with his evil schemes. Amen. Praise God. I want to ask you now, we're going to skip over some pages, and I want to ask you to jump to section 2, letter F. And I know it will take you a minute to get there. Section 2, letter F. I'm going to move from that section where we were to section 2, letter F, where it says strategies of deception. Strategies of deception. Can you find it? Section 2, letter F, strategies of deception. I would give you the page number, except my page numbers are not like yours, so I really can't tell you where it is. But I could, pardon? It's page 24. Page 24, section 2, letter F. It says strategies of deception. I want to talk about these strategies for a minute because this is right in line with where we've been. And I think we've covered enough introduction there to move over to this now. Um, scripture uh, says in Matthew 24, 24, for false Christ and fake or false apostles will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Um, <clears throat> Mickey Winborn said... Liar is his name and deception is his game. Amen. So there are several areas that the devil comes to deceive. And I wanted to really emphasize this because um, I've seen my own self at times. Yes, ma'am. Okay, on yours is 28. 
Okay, page 28 then. <laughs> Thank you for helping us. <coughs> Letter F, Strategies of Deception, page 28. So we're talking about uh, deception and the ways devil, the devil deceives. Uh, and I was trying to say there that uh, sometimes I see Christians fall into some of these areas without realizing it. And so I wanted to cover this so that you'll be able to take this information and help your brothers and sisters when they need it in this area. The number one we're going to talk about is ignorance. Uh, basically, Proverbs 29, 18 um, defines what ignorance is. It's a lack of knowledge of God's word. And the reality is ignorance can destroy. Ignorance can destroy. That's Proverbs 29, 18. God doesn't excuse ignorance. He tells us what to do about it. How many of you, if your child was about to run out in front of a big ca a car coming down the road, and you had, you had, uh, <clears throat> you had uh, out of your emotional response, you had ran and grabbed the child, and you said to the child, don't you ever do that again. How many of you know, as a parent, I probably failed by not realizing the child was old enough now to run out in front of a car and saying to the child, by the way, child, you're old enough now to run out in front of a child, I mean, in front of a car, don't do it, it can hurt you bad. But let's just say for whatever reason, your child wouldn't listen when you said that. Hello. Sometimes we blame things on circumstance when in reality it's ignorance because we would not listen to what the Holy Spirit or the Bible was trying to teach us. God always takes responsibility for warning, instructing, and offering wisdom to protect and to guide his children. The question is, will we listen to him? Will we obey him and receive what he has. So the child then says, I'm not listening to you, mom and daddy. Okay, and then all of a sudden this child runs out in front of a car. Hopefully you catch it before it happens. It could have been detrimental. I think a lot of Christians use ignorance as an excuse to disobey God. And they say, my life is a mess because I didn't know. It's not my fault I didn't know. Hello? But I have to say to you, if God has given us his word, I believe that we have a responsibility to learn that word, to know that word, to seek him for guidance and wisdom daily so that when the enemy begins to lay traps for us, we don't have to say in ignorance, I wouldn't have done it if I had a known. Hello? There's people that are sick today. There are people that are poor today. There are people that aren't in positions of uh, responsibility, promotions. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, leadership, roles that they are supposed to, by destiny, be in. And they are suffering. Their family's suffering. And yet they're telling God all day, every day, and everybody else, if somebody would have helped me, if I had a known, it would be better now. I'm here to tell you that God not only reveals destiny, but he also tells you how to achieve it and how to avoid the obstacles that are going to get in your way. We cannot use ignorance as an excuse for being overcome by the devil or attacks of the devil. Are you following me? Well, the devil's mean and he's always looking for an opportunity. Yes, he is. And that's why the Bible says that you have to be wiser than the devil. Amen. Paul said, don't you be ignorant of the devil's devices. Amen. Oh, but if it wasn't for this governmental system, if it wasn't for the way our society is today. No, 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 no. God will give you the answers and the solutions to overcome the systems, to overcome society. Yes, you're going, but you're going to have to get in his word. You're going to have to pray. You're going to have to study. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. Even in the natural, this applies. Even in the natural. I, I can remember when, well, every level that I have gone through to 
get more training in the Word or more training educationally. I've always thought, is there that much more I can know? And I want to tell you, you go and you earn a new degree or you go and you study the Bible uh, theology or bibliology or whatever, the more you learn, you look back and you go, man, there was so much I didn't know. But you couldn't have convinced me I didn't know it because we honestly believe falsely, it's called deception, that what we have is enough. Now, I'm not talking about desiring things that you're just going to consume upon your own lust. I'm talking about becoming who God says you are. I'm talking about being effective in the things of God. God has called you to greatness, but you cannot get there unless you walk holding his hand each step of the way and you let him guide you and lead you. And it's going to involve testing, trying. It's going to involve learning. It's going to involve stretching. It's going to involve being being willing to be in relationships and in positions you don't want to be in. And sometimes in positions you do want to be in. Hello? Amen? How many people today will say, well, you know, my marriage just didn't work out. Well, guess what? I don't know anybody's that did. Hello? Marriage is one of the greatest tests in life. If you're going to be the person God created you to be, then you're going to have to realize that all your growing and all your testing and all your overcoming starts at home in your personal walk with God and in your walk with your mate. And with your children, you're going to run into the greatest hindrances, obstacles, and, and, and issues right in your own presence, in your home. Well, I'm getting out of this relationship. This is too tough. Guess what? You, you got to learn these lessons in any relationship. I've heard people say, well, I don't go to church anymore because them people are all hypocrites down there. Well, guess what? There's one less one in that church. Because you said you was a Christian, but you're not willing to be stretched. You're not willing to have to put up with people when you don't like things about them. You don't want to be challenged. You don't want to realize that God uses imperfect pastors, imperfect elders. He uses imperfect church members. After all, you've been there, and you're not perfect. You see, it's pride that speaks in our mind and says, and the devil plays off of that to deceive us, amen, and to, to lead us astray. So ignorance is a big deal here. Uh, Joshua 1, eight says, The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous. And then you will have good success. God, can I say that again? Then you will make your way prosperous. Then you will have good success. God is not saying, I'm going to make you prosperous. I'm going to give you success. No, God says, I'm going to give you my law. I'm going to give you my word. And then if you will walk in it, if you will practice it, if you will live it, you will make your way prosperous <coughs> and you will have good success. People all the time be saying, well, God says this about the covenant and God says he's going to do this and God promised me blessings and wealth and all this stuff and here I am and nothing good's happening in my life. Well, God did his part. He gave you his law. He gave you his word. But there's a place now where that word becomes alive in me and where I begin to digest and to receive it. And then as it works mightily in me, it, in me, it doesn't return for it. It begins to produce fruit in my life. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. So the enemy strives to lead us into a blank slate, producing a passive mind that does nothing to seek the truth and overcome ignorance of God's word. I said to you earlier that I, I fear that we have way too many biblically illiterate people in the church as well as in the world today. Why? The devil has deceived people into thinking if you just go to an altar and shake the preacher's hand and repeat the prayer after him, you're going to heaven. And so they do that and then, then they build no relationship with God. They don't get in the word of God. They don't, they don't begin to fellowship with him in the spirit. And because of that, they're deceived 
And they're just kind of like this blank slate floating around and any thought the devil wants to shoot into their mind, they go, oh yeah! yeah. <laughs> and the devil deceives them. And he begins to infiltrate their thinking and their thoughts. God doesn't want us to be passive. God wants us to be active and aggressive in our cooperation with him. Amen? He wants us pursuing truth, pursuing the word. When God speaks truth, that truth is reality for your life. Now go get it. You say, but God said I was going to be healthy and blessed and we're struggling with a physical need. What? What's happening here? God says your body's sick. But he says, but my truth, my reality for you is healing. So God says, there's my word, there's my law. Now you go make yourself prosperous. You go six, make yourself succeed. Hello. Glory to God. Uh, it, you know, it's almost as simple as someone who's physically sick, let's just use the natural world, who's physically sick, they know it, everybody else knows it, people keep telling them, go see the doctor and get treatment and you'll get well. And they say, I ain't going to no doctor. I'm going to no doctor. Guess what? A simple problem today grows into a major life-threatening problem because they refuse to make themselves prosperous and make themselves successful. How many times do pastors and Christian leaders, how many times do the body of Christ read the Word of God and the Word of God tells us explicitly how we're to live and how we're to walk in order to be victorious. And people sit back and says, I just want the victory. I don't want to walk like that. Hello? Amen? Well, it's getting quiet in this charismatic Pentecostal Methodist holiness church. So God doesn't want us passive, amen? Ephesians 5, 17 says, Therefore do not be vague and thoughtless and foolish, but understanding and firmly grasping what the will of the Lord is. I want to tell you something. You and I have an obligation, a responsibility to find out what the will of the Lord is and fight for it. Refuse to accept anything less for your life, for your family, for your church, for the kingdom of God. What is the will of God? Give yourself to it wholly, completely, and totally. Do not compromise in any area because the will of God is God's desire for you and his purpose for you, amen. It is possible to receive thoughts influenced by evil spirits because we do not always recognize the difference between the activity of evil spirits and that of the Holy Spirit in our own human spirit. So we need to be cautious and we need to pray and we need to lay it before God and discern through the word of God, amen. I will not be deceived, amen. Once a person agrees with Satan's suggestions, evil spirits go to work on that person's environment to fulfill demonic purposes. I'm telling you, the devil will have his demons even go out of their way to confirm to you that the evil will of the devil and make it appear that it's coming to pass as though God is affirming it and he is agreeing with it. And I want to tell you, remember one thing. God's will is always holy. It's always righteous. And it's always loving. Amen. So if you step back and you look and you perceive that there's uncertainty in your heart, then you begin to say to yourself, is it holy, righteous? Is it loving? Amen? And is it in agreement with the word of God? Paul recognized this danger and he urged us to destroy these mental strongholds in 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5. It can become a struggle to regain control of our thought lives if we have developed a passive mind. When you turn something off or let it go, it's real hard to turn it back on or to get it back. The devil grasps it. And he holds on to it. We call it a stronghold. Now you've got to fight for what's rightfully yours just to get back to the starting gate again. Uh, and so you've got to enter into intense prayer and warfare. It can become a struggle to regain control of your thoughts. And if we have developed a passive mind, the enemy will fill it with all kinds of thoughts 
that He will use to counter the will of God in your life. It's a spiritual battle in which each of us must exercise on our own mind and make all decisions based on God's Word. Misunderstanding and misapplication of God's truth as given to us in His written Word leads to deception. Doctrinal error can unintentionally come from church leaders, relatives, or others who rationalize or misinterpret certain scriptures. Don't let anybody tell you the Word of God is not true. Don't let anybody tell you the Bible doesn't mean exactly what it says. Don't let anybody tell you that God doesn't do today what He used to do back then. Those are all intentional lies of the devil to begin to throw cold water on your faith and to deceive you from receiving God's best in your life. Amen. And don't receive it. Let's stop right there and take our first break.